So let's get right into it. Before I get into it, I just kind of want to give a little bit of context on this particular chapter. So in Exodus chapter 2, you have um, Moses is born in that chapter, and then Moses decides to side with God's people in that chapter. And then in, in the chapters 4, 5, and 6, God is kind of preparing Moses to confront Pharaoh, and he's also uh, going to do great wonders through Moses uh, to, and cause ten plagues to deliver the children of Israel out of the hand of Egypt, out of the hand of Pharaoh. So this is right in the middle of this. So God does something pretty pivotal in this story. Now, we're not going to get through the entire chapter. We might, we might not. I don't know, for the sake of time. i got quite a bit of scripture here. But um, we're, we're going to just dig right into it. Look at verse number one. It says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Harab. So I want to show you the relationship between Moses and Jethro and how this came about. Okay, so if you can turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2. Look at verse number 16 of Exodus chapter 2. It says, Now the priest of Midian, that's Jethro, had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their flocks, their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. So Jethro has seven daughters. He's telling them, hey, go and uh, water my flock. So they're watering his flock. They're obviously not where they should be. It's not in their land because there's some shepherds that are telling them, hey, get out of here, trying to drive them away. But the Bible says that Moses uh, stood up for them and he watered their flock. Look at verse number 18. It says, and when they came to Ruel, their father, Ruel is Jethro. You probably think, but there's two different names. Well, you know, in the Bible, there are many characters in the Bible that have two different names. I have a couple just that come to mind. The Apostle Paul, right? He was Saul, right? Peter, Cephas. Peter was also Simon, right? Um, and then you have uh, Abraham, which was Abram, right? So this is nothing new. God uses uh, multiple names for the same person. But let's continue. It says, and he said, how is it that ye are come so soon today? So he's impressed as to how fast they got back from watering the flock. So they usually take longer. And, it said, and, and look at verse number 19. It says, and when they said, uh, and they said, excuse me, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, where is he? Why is it that ye have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. So they just, Moses does this this for these ladies, and they just leave them. It, this, this, you know this reminds me of, like, I, I don't know how many times I've walked through a door, and I see, a, like, a lady coming behind me, and I always try to, like, hold the door for them, and they come through, and sometimes they don't say thank you. And you're like, what? I'm not, what in the world? You know, we shouldn't do that to get, like, you know, some type of compliment. But, I mean, geez, at least a thank you. Good night. So I guess these women are in the same boat here, all seven of them. So um, it's, he's, look at verse number 20 again. He said, and he said unto his daughters, where is he? Why is it that ye have left the man? Call him, he may eat bread. So he's saying, hey, you left him behind. I mean, go get him so he can have dinner with us. And uh, look at verse number 21. It says, and Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter. And she bare him a son and called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. So one thing that I kind of noticed here is that the characteristic of Moses here. So Moses, right, is so charismatic. He's so charming that, <laughs> that Jethro just gives him his daughter after that first night. Like, all right, here you go. Take my daughter. He was impressed with Moses, the way he carried himself, the way he was. So that impressed him quite a bit. Um, and, and also, he ended up giving him uh, his daughter, and they end up having a son named Gershom, right? And he said, for he, uh, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. So he named him Gershom because he was a stranger in a strange land. And that's no different from parents today, right? 
So when they name their children, for example, most of the children in this church are named after uh, a Bible a book or a Bible character, or because you know what, that's what's in our heart. And you look at the world, and you look at like the celebrities, and then they get all these weird names. Well, then you find out what's in their heart. I mean, good night. You name your kid Northwest. I mean, that's a weird name, right? But those are weird people, okay? So that just goes to show where their heart is at. And, and, and it shows that also, you know, they name their children off something that's very special to them. You know, this was a special circumstance that happened, so Mo Moses wanted to remember this moment, all right? So uh, I want to point out three characteristics that uh, Christian, uh, Christians should have, mainly men should have here that, that Moses is showing. And this seems to be like a reoccurring thing that's been, go been preaching at our church. Uh, but just the first thing I want to show you is that Christian men are tough, okay? And it's funny because society takes Christian men and they just soften them up and say they're supposed to be, you know, soft-spoken and, and just quiet and whatever. But that's not what the Bible is showing here. Look at verse number 17. It says, and the shepherd came, Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. So notice it says there, and the shepherds, plural. You know, there was at least two guys telling these seven women to get out of here, and I'm sure there was more, but um, at least two. And Moses stands up to them, and he was intimidating enough for them to say, uh, maybe not that guy, you know. But they were tough enough to come at seven women, but Moses, they didn't come at. See, if Moses was just some scrawny weakling, he would have been one of the other women. <laughs> you know what I mean? They wouldn't have been threatened by him. Okay? So men, Christian men, need to be tough, right? Another characteristic of a Christian man is to be strong, right? Physically strong, right? So look at, um, look at verse number 19. It says, And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew enough water for us, and watered the flock. So check that out. So he ends up giving water, right? To, um, uh, to, the, to the girls, right, to all seven women, that means they weren't working. He watered the flock while they were drinking water. He did it all by himself. And look at verse number, uh, let me see. Look at verse number 18. It says, And when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that you have come so soon today? So not only did he do it all by himself, but he did it faster than all seven of them. Right? So that shows us that Christian men need to be strong. You know, I think the pastor preached on this the other day about how heavy water is. And he's here transporting water for the whole flock. Right? So these are characteristics that we need to have. Another characteristic, and this is more towards Christians in general, right? It, and you know what? Strength and toughness also goes for women. You know, Proverbs 31 shows us that. But Look at verse uh, number 21. It says, And Moses was content to dwell with the man. So, for those that know the story about Moses, Moses came from an Egyptian background. But not just in Egypt. Moses was pretty much in royalty. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses was in a position where anything he asked for, he can have it. Right? And here he is dwelling with a family that doesn't have much. They're obviously getting water from not their, their part of town. They're, they're getting these resources from somewhere else. And he's still content to dwell with them. You know, and that's a characteristic we need to have. When we're around people you know, that might be less fortunate than we are, we need to be content. We should never look down on somebody else like we're better than them. Never. We're not better than anybody. Let me tell you something. We're have the, we, we deserve the same fate. You know, thank God that you put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're not going to hell, but hey, you just still deserve it. You know, they, they're going to hell, but you still deserve it. But guess what? God is merciful unto his children, right? His mercies endureth forever. So we're never going to face that, but don't forget that. So when you're around people, you should want to, you know, be content with them. You know, when you go, like, this ha usually this happens when people go to mission trips and stuff like that. They go to third world countries. They get an like, eye-opening view of how things really are. Because sometimes in the United States, you don't really see things that clearly. 
But for example, I went on my honeymoon with my wife to Cuba, right? Cuba's extremely oppressed and extremely poor country, but those people will take the shirts off their back for you. If they know you're coming, they'll, they'll just um, hoard a bunch of food or a bunch of money to try to buy enough food so when you get there, they can make you a feast. See, they're hospitable, and, and you saw that Jeffro was the same way. And when I went to Cuba with my wife, I, you couldn't even tell I wasn't Cuban with the way I act there. I just was content. They put food in front of me. I ate it no matter what. You know what? Bless it and eat it. All right? So this is a characteristic that you see throughout the Bible. For example, Paul in Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse number 11, he says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And I know both how to be abased, and I know how to be, ab how to be abound everywhere, and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to be abound and to suffer need. So Paul had this characteristic. Wherever you put Paul, he was happy. He was happy. Right? We shouldn't have this puffed up mentality. You know, this stuff also goes into cultures as well. You know, I talked about Cuba, but the Latino culture is the same thing. You know, God forbid you tell a Cuban or a Puerto Rican, Colombian, Ecuadorian, you call them a Mexican. It's like you completely offended them, like it's the worst thing ever. That's the dumbest thing ever I've ever heard. You know, and, and it happens in other cultures, like Asian cultures as well. God forbid you call a Korean or a Japanese person Chinese. It's like, what? Look, that's dumb, folks. That, that doesn't make any sense. You're not better than anybody else. No one is, right? All right, let's continue. Look at verse number two. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire, uh, yeah, in the flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. <clears throat> so I want to get a little bit of commentary on this. So if you can turn to Acts chapter 7, there's some commentary on, on, this, on this story and Exodus 1 and 2. So turn to Acts chapter 7. Look, it's okay to read commentary. There's nothing wrong with reading commentary. I'll tell you when reading commentary is wrong. When you're reading commentary outside the Bible. When you're reading man's opinion on what the Bible says. Instead of just opening up the Bible and reading it yourself. And let the Holy Spirit teach you the Bible. All right. So look at verse number 17. It says, but when the, uh, excuse me, but when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil and treated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him uh, for her son, for her own son. So let me just kind of expound on this uh, right now. So there, there was a time where God had promised Abraham that he was going to uh, uh, multiply his seed and the children of Israel multiplied in Egypt. <clears throat> And there was a king that arose that didn't know Joseph, didn't know God. He felt threatened by the numbers that were there. So he puts out this decree to kill all the male Hebrew children by tossing them into the river. So uh, Moses was born, and his parents, despite this decree, they still had a child. No matter what was going on around them, they said, hey, we're going to put our faith on God, and we're going to let God... Uh, provide for us. We're going to let God protect our child. So they end up having Moses, and they try to keep him quiet for three months. But, you know, you can't keep a baby from, from not crying for a full three months. And, you know, things were just going to get figured out sooner or later. So they had, to, they had to do something about it. So they ended up taking Moses, Moses' mother, ended up taking, making a makeshift boat out of bulrushes. If you don't know what a bulrush is, if you go right outside the door out here, there's a plant by the bookcase, and they're like some Q-tip looking plants. Those are bulrushes. So she made a makeshift boat out of bulrushes, and she sent out Moses, and Moses' sister was watching to make sure it didn't sink. 
And they, they went in, uh, Moses went unto Pharaoh's daughter, which was in the river, and she saw Moses and had compassion on him. But she couldn't nurse him. So she sent him to one of the Hebrew uh, women, and it ended up being Moses' mom. <laughs> I mean, God was in that all the way. And Moses' mom nursed uh, Moses. And here's the thing, today women nurse for a week and then they get back to work, right? But in this time, that's not what was happening. They were nursing for a lot longer than that. So I'm pretty sure quite a few years, I mean, it doesn't give a description in the Bible, but I'm sure it was quite a few years. Now, um, look at verse number 22. Uh, Brother Carter, can you get me a water, please? Um, look at verse number 22. It says, And Moses was learned in all wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, uh, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. Deliver them. But they understood not. <clears throat> and the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have sent them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one another? So Moses, he's, he's, uh, he's trained as an Egyptian. So she could only nurse him for so long before, before she had to let him go back to Pharaoh, his daughter. So he ends up living in Egypt, and he ends up being uh, an Egyptian, you know, uh, being learned in all the wisdom of Egypt, and was mighty in word in the deeds of Egypt, Right? And then it came into his heart after 40 years to side with God's people, and he ended up killing an Egyptian that was oppressing uh, one of the Hebrew men, right? Now, notice it said 40 years. So I don't know what Moses' mother was telling him, what she was guiding him, what she was teaching him, what hymns she was singing to him while she was nursing him, but he decided after 40 years to get right with God, to go back. See, there are things in our life that we do that our parents might have taught us that we probably still do to this day, right? So this here shows that Moses was brought up the right way. Now, he was obviously influenced by Egypt, but in his heart was God's people, right? Now look at verse number 24. It says, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have, uh, would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Will thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? They f uh, then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begot two sons. So Moses is like, they're going to get it. I, I kill this Egyptian. They're going to get that I'm here to deliver them. And they didn't get it. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Same thing happened with Christ, right? So they didn't get it. Um, he, they, there's two Hebrew men wronging one another, and he says, hey, you guys are brothers. Why are you wronging one another? And they say, who made you a ruler and a judge over us, right? So uh, he says, are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian? So he felt threatened. He said, you know what? I'm getting out of here because... It's, I've been figured out. They know that I've killed this Egyptian. Pharaoh's going to come after me. I'm going to get out of here, right? That's the commentary for Exodus chapter 2. Look at uh, verse number 30. It says, And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Signa an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. So notice where it says there, And 40 years were expired see that? Again, another 40 years. So Moses was in the world for 40 years, and then he decides to side with God's people. But it wasn't until 40 years later that God decides to use 
Moses. See, here's the thing. When you live in the world, it takes some time to purge the world out of you. It takes some time to get that sin out of you. And hey, the longer you've lived in the world, the harder it is for that sin to get out of you. I mean, there are some sins that we commit in our lives. If we were saved later in life, look, I was saved later in life. I was saved in my late 20s. You know, I'm 32. So I was saved later on in life. I wasn't always uh, a Christian in a suit. Was not, it was not at all. You know, so it took some time for God to purge me. But that time is not, so you're probably thinking, wait a minute. So if I was saved at 25, I got to wait 25 years. No, no, no. Wrong, wrong. If you're willing, then the time it takes for God to use you is a lot shorter. It's a lot shorter than the 40 years. But see, Moses was so influenced. Moses was so deep into the world that it took him that amount of time. Right? Now, uh, turn back to Exodus chapter 3. <clears throat> Look at verse number 2. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, in a, flame, uh, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. <clears throat> so notice that it said there that Moses said, I will now turn aside. See that? So I'm wondering how many times God has tried to show himself to Moses. So let me pose that same question to you. How many times has God tried to show himself to you? Before you were saved, how many times did he try to get your attention for you to actually get to where you are now? Huh? And how about when you were saved? How many times have you heard preaching behind the pulpit that has inspired you, but you've done nothing with it? You were a hearer of the word. And you were not a doer of the word. How many times? Now, God spoke to me one time. And I, I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of story. So let me just give you a story of how God spoke to me one time. And I didn't listen. All right. So I was with a friend of mine. And we were working, uh, doing some pool renovations in Florida. Man, it was hot. All right. So we do pool renovations in Florida. We had a job site that we were going to, and it was about an hour away, kind of near Disney. It was about an hour away. So we're driving out there, and when we get there and we park, the truck smells like smoke. We pop the hood, and the engine is on fire. But not like a huge fire, just a little fire. And I can't remember if my friend blew it out. He tried to blow it out, but I know I had a gallon of water with me. I always had a gallon of water with me because of how hot it was. And I think I poured the water on it. He blew it out. I can't remember that detail. But um, they ended up towing the truck. In a couple days, I went and I got the truck. Right? We go to another job site. Kind of equal distance. It wasn't as far, but we go to another job site. Truck's running fine. Um, we get there. We do the work. My friend has to leave early because he has to pick up his kids from daycare. So it was three of us at the job site. The other guy had another truck. So we stayed, finished the job, we're driving back. When we are halfway there about, I stop at a red light. I'm in the truck that was messed up. And I start to feel like a shake. I'm like, okay. And like the worst thoughts started running through my head. And I'm here with the steering wheel like this. And I can just imagine fire coming through the steering wheel and just the whole cabin catching fire and me being locked in and just being in torment, right? I just envisioned that in my own imagination. I'm like, man, I need, to get, I need to get to the office. We need to get this truck parked. So I get to the office, I park the truck, and lo and behold, I smell smoke. I pop the hood, and there's a little bit more fire, so I'm trying to blow it out. I'm like, wait, I got water. I go to the truck, I drank all my water. All of it. I didn't know how I was going to put that fire out. So I'm like, blowing, blowing, it's getting bigger and bigger. So I turn around, I go to the office, I start pounding on the door, hoping someone's going to respond. And the guy that I was working with was in there. So we come out with a fire extinguisher. He's trying to put the fire out, right? No, not successful. 
the, the airbags started blowing up. Ambulance, uh, like the firefighters came. And I was like, whoa. And I was like, man, I could have died. I could have been burning in there. You know what? I feel like God was trying to talk to me at that time. And I still didn't go. God was trying to tell me, hey, if you don't get right with me, that fear you had, you'll have that forever. Forever. So, you know, keep that in mind. Keep it in mind that, hey, there are people out there that if they don't get right with God, meaning they don't get saved, they're going to have that forever, that burning, that fear, right? All right, so let's continue. I lost my place. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, verse number three, where we read it, and it says, And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. <clears throat> verse number four, it says, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. So notice that God finally now reaches out to Moses. Right? He had, it had to be when Moses decided to look, decided to see, that God said, Moses, Moses. See that? <clears throat> and Moses says, here am I. Here's the thing. You know, <clears throat> God is going to draw nigh to you, not draw nigh to you if you draw nigh to him. You know, uh, James chapter 4, verse number 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded men. Or ye double-minded. See that? So, if we draw to God, he'll draw nigh to us. But guess what? It says right after that, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts. See, God is going to use a clean vessel. God's not going to use a sinful, dirty vessel. Now, hey, look, if you're willing, God will use you a little bit. But when you start to take sin out of your life, when you start to get right with God, when you start to go to church on a regular basis, when you start to do things for the Lord, hey, then God will start to use you more and more, right? See, God is a God of action. See, there, the, the word repent of your sins gets a bad rap, right? Because these false prophets, they link it up with salvation. Hey, we know salvation is through faith only, right? And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There's no repenting there. It's just believing. Now, repent in the sense of, from unbelief to belief, but that's it. Repent just means to turn, right? God is a God of action. You know, the pastor was preaching on Sunday, and he was in that love chapter, right, or charity chapter. And, and, and you know, he, he mentioned love because these false uh, versions will use the word love in place of charity, right? But if you look at the word charity, it's a, it's a word of action. You know, how vain is it when someone tells you they love you but they don't really do anything to show that, right? So, you know, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments, right? So God is a God of action. He requires us to cleanse ourselves before he uses us. The more we cleanse ourselves, the more he would use us, all right? Go back to Exodus chapter 3, or we're still there. Um, look at verse number 5. And he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Now, when I first read this, you know, like reading my Bible, I was like, what does that mean? Like, take off your shoes because it's holy ground. There's actually another story just like this. Go to Joshua chapter 5. Go to Joshua chapter 5. Look at verse number 13. It says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man o over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I. Come now. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth 
and did worship him and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto this servant? And the captain of the Lord's, uh, of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy foot, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. And Joshua did so. <clears throat> See, God, you have to be, um, when it comes to, to, to um, I lost my train of thought. I'll get it back. Um, when it comes to that standing on holy ground, right? See, God wants you to be um, in, in a, in a uh, good night. It's, okay. God wants you to come to him humbly, right? So he wants you to come to him in the standards that, he, that you should be, in the highest standards. He wants you to worship him. See, um, <clears throat> when, when Joshua was confronted by the captain of the Lord of the host, he fell on his face, right? So we need to come to God with that same respect. See, that angel, that angel, I believe, is the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason why I believe that that's the Lord Jesus Christ is because when Joshua worshipped him, the angel didn't stop him from the worship. The angel received the worship. And we see in the New Testament, when people worship Jesus, Jesus received that worship. He didn't reject it. But you have people like Peter, when he was being worshipped, is trying to get people off the ground. Don't worship me, I'm a man like you. You know, angels in the book of Revelation were being worshipped, and they didn't take that worship. I believe this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22. Look at verse number 11. It says, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. That sounds familiar, right? And look at verse number 22. It says, And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So notice, the angel says in that verse, For now I know thou fearest God. And then he says, Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. Notice that it, that angel didn't say from God. He said from me. Making himself equal to God. Who else made himself equal to to God, Christ. Christ made himself equal to God. So that's why I believe that that, that, that angel is the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but, you know, one thing we also have to consider about, you know, taking off your shoes, you know, because that's, thou standest on holy ground, is, you know, we need to have a proper standard when we come to God, right? See, this church, right, we, I'm wearing a suit right now. There are no clothing standards in this church for you to attend this church. See, if, it, you know, if you're a woman, you're coming in with pants, you're accepted in the church, right? There's no clothing standards in the church, but we believe in clothing standards, right? So there's no clothing standards, but we believe in clothing standards. So if you come and you wear pants, hey, you're accepted in this church. Uh, but if you're a guy and you come here in a dress, Wrong church. Before I could even see you, I'm pretty sure Brother Carter is tossing you out the door. Right? Well, I thought there was no clothing standards. Well, look, because 100% of the time, those are a bunch of weirdos. Right? And guess what we have here? Children. And we love and protect our children. All right? See, Deuteronomy 22.5 says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that, ha that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So, an abomination is being hated by God. You know, oh, that's the Old Testament. Well, you know what? The Word is Jesus Christ. You have so many of these denominations that want to try to not 
not listen to the Old Testament. Just completely disregard it. No, hey, look, we're in the Old Testament right now, and we're getting some sound doctrine from the Old Testament. Go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. All right, look at verse number 6. It says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So this whole time Moses is looking at God, and God then reveals, hey, this is who I am. The God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob. And he goes, whoa. You know what? We need to have a proper respect when we come to the Lord. Not just in our clothing standards, but just when we come to God, we need to have the right attitude. Right? We need to come to God, you know, with some type of humility. So, <clears throat> for example, like, uh, good night, I lost my place again. <laughs> this has been happening to me all night. Um, you know, you and God are not like homies. Okay? You and God are not homies. He's not, he's not the big man upstairs. He's not JC. No, he's Jesus Christ. He's God Almighty. He's Jehovah. You need to have some respect, some reverence when you approach the Lord. <clears throat> Look, uh, and you know, another thing too, you know, taking the Lord's name in vain. Don't go around and say, oh my God, for no reason. If you're going to go to God like that, you better be praying to God and you better mean it. If you don't believe that uh, taking the Lord's name in vain is not a sin, if you believe that's not a sin, read Exodus 20. Okay? It's clear. <clears throat> Look at verse number 7 of Exodus 3. It says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Isn't it great that God knows our sorrows? You know, the Bible says that we have a high priest that was tempted in all points, but was without sin. So God, Christ, knows what we're going through. Not only that, he paid for every single one of the sins that we commit forever on the cross. So he knows pain. He's no stranger to pain. He knows what it's like to be betrayed by someone he thought was close to him. Look at Judas Iscariot, right? It was in the beginning, but again, he was still betrayed, right? So look at, uh, look at verse number eight. It says, And I am come down to deliver them out of the, land, out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So right there, that's God's commandment. That's God's commission. Right? That God gives us a commission. We're not delivering the children out of, uh, out of Israel, right? The children of Israel out of uh, Egypt. But hey, he commanded us to go soul winning. He commanded us to go preach the gospel. That's what we should be doing. We should be saving people from fire. Right? Turn to Isaiah chapter 6 for me. Isaiah chapter 6. So this is Isaiah. He has a vision. But... Take witness of the attitude that Isaiah has here. Look at verse number one. It says, 
in the year of the king Uz, uh, Uzziah died, I saw, yeah, good night. King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims. Each one had six wings, with twain, uh, with, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he hath taken from the tongs uh, from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and, go, and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. See that? That's the attitude we need to have. So when God approaches us, hey, who's going to go for me? You need to be, hey, right here, this guy, this guy. Look, folks, I have insecurities as well. I get nervous. I mess up. Look. When I went out soul winning for the first time, I watched Brother Brian give the gospel to a couple people, and I was watching him, and I said, you know what? I'm going to try to do that the second day. By the second day, I was talking. Now, I don't recommend that, you know, but sometimes you just got to do it. You know God has brought you here for a reason. The only way to learn something is just to do it, right? You know, probably thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm not that good of a speaker, so... I don't know if I could really knock on somebody's door. I don't really know if I can preach the gospel to somebody. I'm not, look, you're in the right church. If you don't know how to go soul winning, you're in the right church. We can equip you for that. But hey, what about right here? You know, we have men's preaching classes that we do at this church. You know, we had one just this last Saturday, right? And look, I encourage the men, if you can make it, if work isn't stopping you, to go. You know, I heard that there was a, a, a gentleman in the class, it was their first time there, and they got up and preached. Amen. Glory to God. We should all have that attitude. Right? So, look at, uh, look at verse number 11. And Moses said unto God, Who am I? That I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children uh, of Israel out of Egypt. See, Moses also had his insecurities. You know, I've heard, you know, this, uh, this, uh, this passage be preached before, and, and sometimes people are a little bit hard on Moses. You know, like, oh, he's, he was scared or whatever. He, you know, he was being dis no, no, look, he's human. And look, look, Moses was humble, okay? See, we might be nervous, we might be scared, we might be timid to do things, but Romans 10.4 says, How then shall they call on him? Uh, whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So if you're not willing to go out there and preach the gospel and try to get people saved, who else is going to do it? Look, don't have this attitude where, oh, well, you know, Brother Pete can do it. Oh, Brother Carter do it. Oh, Brother Deb. Oh, all the people in the church can do it. No, no, you do it. Because why? Because God commanded you to do it. Right? You know, and if you don't know how to do something, then study. Then learn. Then take notes. Then, then follow someone that's doing it. Right? Uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approve unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if you don't know something, hey, study it out. Study it out. Turn back to Acts chapter 7. I should have told you to hold your finger there, but easy to find. <laughs> Acts 
Acts chapter 7. Look at verse number 24. It says, And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Remember that? We read that earlier. And it says, verse number 25, For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. So I want you to notice that Moses' attitude changed. When Moses was in the world, when Moses was in Egypt, when Moses was given everything, when Moses was spoiled, but he had God in his heart, right? He says, well, hey, they should know that I'm here to deliver them. I'm here to deliver them. No. Look, it's the wrong attitude. That's why God took 40 years to finally use him because his attitude wasn't right so <clears throat> we need to have the right attitude but also um, hmm. notice that Moses was cocky with that attitude that he had but if we look back at um, verse number 11 oh, what is it verse number yeah, verse number 11 of Exodus 3, he said, who am I? Right? So the attitude for Moses changed dramatically. Moses was now humble. See, now God can use Moses. All right? Forgive my inconsistencies tonight. All right? Bear with me. You know, but let's continue. <clears throat> uh, go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. See, God couldn't use Moses when he was puffed up. God couldn't use him when he was arrogant. God had to wait for him to be humble and for him to actually seek God, for him to actually use him, right? <clears throat> and, you know, the same thing happens with Paul. This is the Apostle Paul speaking in 2 Corinthians. Verse number 7, it says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. <clears throat> and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, God's strength is shown through your weakness. So you have insecurities. You feel like you can't do it. You know what? God will use you mightily. He will use you mightily even if you're in that position. If you don't think you can do it, God can do it. Right? Look at, uh, look at verse number... Uh, tw go back to Exodus chapter 3. <clears throat> look at verse number 12. And it says, uh, And he said, Certainly... I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that, that I have sent thee, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt. Ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto, the, unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, That God of, of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said, unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, hath sent me unto you. So Moses is saying, Hey, when I go deliver the children of Israel, and they say who you, know, who you are, what should I say? What's the name I should give them? And God says, I am that I am. That name is pretty interesting. You know, notice that that name 
is in the present tense. You know, when we have conversation, most of the conversation we have is in the past tense and in the future. But God is now. God is always, right? <clears throat> look, at, uh, look at verse number 15. It says, And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So notice God said uh, in this verse, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. Notice when God puts a name down, it's forever. Right? It's a memorial to all generations. You know, it's funny, there's a false religion known as the Jehovah Witnesses. All right, or what we like to call them, the Jehovah False Witnesses. And they think that, hey, there's only one name we should call God, and that's Jehovah, right? So let me tell you where I think they get this from. Turn to Psalms chapter 83. Look at, uh, look at verse number 18. It says, That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. See that? So they say, oh, you see? Jehovah name. His name alone is Jehovah. Right? <clears throat> turn, to, uh, turn to Exodus chapter uh, 6. And I'm going to read Psalm 148, verse 13. It says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Oh, but I thought His name alone was Jehovah. His name alone is excellent as well. I don't see excellent witnesses running around here. I see Jehovah witnesses running around. See, when God establishes a name, it's forever. So, yes, it's Jehovah. Yes, it's excellent. Yes, it's almighty. Right? Look at, uh, look at verse number 3 there of Exodus 6. And it says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by the name Jehovah, I was not known to them. See that? So, what did the Jehovah Witnesses got to say about that? The God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. Turn to Psalms 138. We're almost done. Look at verse number one. It says, I will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods. I will sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. See that? So God has magnified thy word, or his word, over all his name. Right? See, the word is Jesus Christ. Right? Uh, turn to John 1 for me. I'm going to turn there myself. So I don't have it in my notes. Look at verse number one. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. 
or, yeah, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Look at verse number 14. It says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we behold his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. See? So Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father, is the Word. And Jesus is the only name that saves. All right? Last, last place I'm going to have you turn, I'm going to put this to rest. Acts chapter 4. If you're wondering why the, why the sermon went on so long, I didn't turn the timer on. <laughs> it's all right. We'll keep it under, before midnight, I'll tell you guys to get home. All right. Acts chapter 4, look at verse number 10. It says, Be it known unto you all and, all, and, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth his, does this man stand here before you, you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of the builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men where we must be saved. See, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is that name. There's no other name under heaven that we must be saved. All right. You know, I really enjoy this story. You know, I look in this story and I see things. And, you know, I hope that this sermon was able to encourage you to want to do something more for God. Want to be able to take your walk with Christ to another level. You know, to be a blessing among the church. Anyone listening on YouTube that stays in Georgia, you know, that goes to a lame church, I think it's time that you leave that church and go to a church that's going to use you. That you can go out and be equipped to win people to Christ instead of just sitting in a pew. All right? Look, it was a pleasure preaching the night. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the stories in the Bible, Lord, that we can draw principles from, Lord. Lord, every single word in the Bible is precious, and we thank you for it, and uh, we honor it, Lord. Lord, uh, I hope that this sermon was edifying to the people here, Lord. I hope I uh, did uh, the Bible justice by preaching, Lord. Lord, I, um, I love you, and we all love you here, and we just want to do more for you, Lord. And we want, it, we want you to use us, Father. And we just pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.